20 minutes before 8 here on the program. So this morning we're going to be continuing the conversation on leadership. And uh, we still have in studio with us the group chief executive of Eltron, Nteto Nyati. And uh, I hope you, you, you got to see the first part of the interview just to talk about the excellence in leadership and a little bit about Mteto. And if you haven't seen it and you've just joined us now, always go to the SABC News YouTube channel and everything is uploaded there almost minutes after the interview. So it'll be great for you to take a look at that. But now this morning, we're also joined by another guest, Peter Chisebe, who is the founder and chair of TGR Attorneys. Now, they specialize in corporate and commercial law. The company advises on mergers and acquisitions, listings on stock exchanges and private equity with clients in both the private and public sector. Uh, Mr. Chifebe is uh, Chisebe, I should say, uh, serves as a South African Airways board member as well and has experience in both private and public sector. And uh, that's really what we want to discuss now. The differences in leadership between the public and the private sector. It's so good to have you here, Peter. Welcome and good to have you still in Teto. Thanks so much for staying with us. Thank you, Lee. So, I mean, is there a difference? That, that, that's the, I suppose, starting question. We talk about the difference in, in, in leadership roles in the private and the public sector. I mean, isn't being a leader being a leader and it should just stay the same? Definitely there is no difference, uh, particularly when you look at it from the company law point of view, in the sense that the company sector applies both to SOEs, which are state-owned companies, and to private companies, which include mal large multinationals. So mm. there isn't really a difference I in terms of leadership requirements. Perhaps we could say there shouldn't be a difference. Yes. But is there? In reality, is there a difference? You've had experience in both. I think there is some difference um, by virtue of the fact that uh, in private companies you will be governed by the Companies Act. In public companies is the Companies Act and the PFMA. And sometimes it's a conflict in terms of you know, what is required. And you must also bear in mind that being in business means you need to be agile. You must be able to take opportunities quickly. What hampers state-owned companies in general is the requirement to comply with PFMA, mm. the bureaucracy associated with decision-making. And um, I'll give you an example. If someone was to set up you know, a construction site next door, an entrepreneur will quickly go and set up a shop to service the workers there. But in a public sector, you need to comply with all requirements. By the time you've complied with the requirements, the opportunity is gone. So that is the challenge. Yeah. The other issue that I see to be a major difference is that in public companies or companies that are private, the shareholders appoint the board and the board make all key decisions. Whereas in SOEs, there is a lever that um, shareholders want to play in that they need to have a veto right or approval of the appointment of the CFO and the CEO. I think that's wrong fundamentally, and I was the advisor to government on the review of the state-owned uh, entities uh, under the leadership of Ria Piech at the time. And my advice has always been to say that, you know, government must appoint boards and let the boards decide. Yeah. So you can then appoint a board and want to really play a role in appointing certain members of the board. Yeah. That is a challenge. It, it, it is a big challenge because I think what we sit and report on over and over again and we talk to and we see CEOs come into, into, the, private se well, into the public sector, they go, they run SOEs and they leave because the, the, the outside interference from government is too much to handle. You know the private sector exceptionally well, Mteto. Now, if we, if we look at the role that a CEO will play, going to the likes of an, S, uh, uh, an well. SAA, going into <coughs> the likes of ESCOM, I mean, is it from that side? I, I, mean, I know you've never held one of those positions, but it must be a much more difficult role in terms of interference and outside interference. Look, uh, in my mind, uh, whether you go to a private sector or public sector, uh, role, uh, it doesn't matter. You've got stakeholders that as a CEO you need to manage. 
You've got the stakeholder who happens to be your board. It could be government if you are in the private sector. Uh, you've got a board as well in, 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 the, in the public sector. You know, you've got people that continue. Even in the boards in the private sector, you've got chairmen that sometimes want to run your company. So you have to try and manage those relationships. It's something that comes uh, with the job. Mm. One needs to be able to manage the key stakeholders. So that's one thing. But the big difference that I seem to see uh, when it comes to the public sector is that sometimes you are appointed there. Your job is not to make things uh, go well. <laughs> In fact, your job is to continue to create even more chaos because people are getting benefits out of having a situation that is chaotic, you know. That is the situation where people, you are in there and you are trying to fix things and you are actually working against interests which uh, benefit out of the chaos. Yeah. That is the problem that most people are, are facing when they get into those companies. So it's either they put people that are incompetent who clearly continue to create that chaos, or if you are competent and you want to do the right things, you won't be, be lasting in, in those environments. So yeah. that, to me, is the difference. Uh, whereas in the public sector, always they want you to perform. You know, uh, your board wants you to deliver the results, yeah. so they are there behind you. Mm. And, th and that's the mm. way things should be. Yes, exactly. I, I mean, mm. when you look at the likes mm. of, and, and I keep on emphasizing ESCOM because I think that, mm. well, I mean, I, I don't know which is more sensitive, ESCOM or SAA. Mm. I suppose ESCOM because it touches all of our lives mm. every single day. When those lights go off, mm. people start screaming, where are the leaders in this country? Mm. Why don't we have them? And we do have them. I'm mm. sitting in front of two incredible leaders, mm. and yet... Teto, I'm going to ask you quite a pro personal question. If you were approached to take over as a CEO of any SOE, would you do it? Uh, it would depend on the timing. For example, right now, where I am at this time, uh, I'm busy with a particular you know, project yeah. within Altron. I'd like to see that through. Mm. But it, if they were to come at the right time, uh, of course I would put some conditions and say, I would go in, but uh, please, uh, minister, make sure that you do not interfere, board, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. There needs to be certain conditions. Uh, look at what's, ha what's happening with, uh, with telecom, you know. We've got an SOE there that is functioning properly, yeah. in my mind, you know. Uh, why? Because you had a, 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 a chairman that protected that CEO from uh, interference. Mm -hmm. You know, Jabu did a, a great job there for SIPO, and yet now you can see how SIPO has been able to deliver. So it can be done, but you need to put those things up front. Don't take the job and then you come with your requirements later. It's too late. It's too late then, mm. and, that's a, and that's a big issue. Yeah. You yeah. sit on the board of mm. SAA, Peter, mm. and I mean, I'm not going to be asking you private information. Obviously, these mm. are things that you're not going to be discussing on a public, uh, uh, on a public platform. Yes. But if, if we look at the differences between um, a public board mm. and a, a private entity's board, mm. you know, that lack of interference, you said yourself that the board is the one at the end of the day where the buck stops. And mm -hmm. a lot of the time we see board members resigning because they just cannot take it. And they are also responsible for a lot of downfalls of the way the running of companies go, state-owned enterprises in particular. Mm -hmm. And they just feel that their hands are tied. They can't do anything because all the instructions come from government and the board have got very little to do with all of this. I mean, are these, are these thoughts in our minds true or is it a fallacy? Look, um, I'm, I'm not sure about that interference, but let me say this. Um, there is a big issue that people don't understand about leadership, particularly in companies. You see, as a leader in a company, you are a fiduciary. What does that mean? It means you look after the interests of others. That is not only limited to a board member in my view, it also applies to the leadership in government. And so, what are the requirements of a fiduciary? The requirements of a fiduciary are to always act in the best interest of the company. I want to respond to what uh, Mr. Tete have said mm. and say the following, and I've written an article about it. I believe at the heart of the challenges that we're facing as a country, be in the private or public sector as far as leadership is concerned, is the quality of the fiduciary. Let me explain to you in my experience as a lawyer. When a decision is taken in a company, it goes via through a number of layers. And if 
the quality of the fiduciary is improved at those various layers, it's not possible to give instructions. In other words, if for argument's sake, someone was to come and say to me, Peter, I want you to employ Muteto as this and that and that. There is a governance framework that regulates that. For that decision to be made, it needs to go through a layer of people. So if those people are empowered to always look for the interests of the company and protect them, it's not possible to do so. So in a way, in my view, and I, I argue strongly and I believe that, part of the solution to the challenges that we're facing in governance is actually to improve the quality of the fiduciary. Mm -hmm. If we do that, our problems are half solved. Let me explain to you. When I was a leader at university many years ago, I became a chairman of a very premier residence, EOH, in a stop and hammer hall. At the time, blacks considered about 40% of the student population and whites were about 60%. But we managed to win the elections and we had a strategy. The strategy was informed by our understanding of the dynamics. We knew what was important for the students and we coached them in terms of how they will vote for us. And we realized that our interests with those of the Washington were not aligned. They were more concerned about jokes. You know, people stood on various tickets to try and promote different things. Yeah. But we were focused. So, so what is important is you need a fiduciary that understand. If I start speaking vendor here, Manas, you won't be able to say, you can hear me talking. Maybe I'm praising you or maybe I'm insulting. You won't. Mm. So at the heart of leadership is the understanding what you're dealing with. In law, I remember when I was at Vets many years ago, we used to have a slogan to say, I'm not just an official bystander. That thinking was informed by understanding that you're not there to stand, you are there to defend your clients. And you can only do that when you understand. The same applies to the fiduciary. Yeah, yeah. A, re a really good point. It mm. really is an mm. eye-opening point. Mm. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you want to comment on that, Mteta. Look, uh, he is absolutely correct. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. But unfortunately, sometimes that's why I say that you can have all of these great things, but if there is a deliberate effort to, to put people there that are not going to be able to exercise what he's talking about, you know, you can have all of that, but yeah. it is useless. Yeah, you, know? you can have the best of the best, yeah. mm. and they will fail. Yeah. Uh, mm. I mean, and, and one of the, the big criticisms as well is, mm. is, is, is political deployees in government positions. Mm. Mm. And so many people look to this and say, but... They've done it and they failed before, and then you move them from one position to the next position, and it's just, it's this mentality of, you know, it's a favor, and it's, uh, there's, there's agendas at stake here, and mm. you know that the agenda is not necessarily in the best interest of the South African public, mm. and that's, it's a narrative that we've seen over and over again. Peter, I mean, I don't know if you want to comment on that, political deployees. No, um, my view, again, is the same, as far as that is concerned. I'm saying... Let's take it from the president's side. He's a fiduciary vis-a-vis -vis the people of the Republic of South Africa. So if he makes decisions in appointing cabinet, he needs to be able to appoint people that he's got confidence in, that they are able to deliver. The same with the minister. If a minister is responsible for an SOE and he understands his role, that his role is not about himself, it's not about his ego, but about putting South Africa first, then the issue of cadre deployment becomes irrelevant. In other words, that minister will then look for the best person for the job and will actually abide by the decisions that mm. relates to the management of that company. Mm. So, mm. in other words, the best way to manage this is to empower the fiduciary. When you have someone who does not know any better about governance, what do you expect? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The best person for the job. Let's 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 take it that and, and, and take a stab at that conversation as well. Love your book. Mm -hmm. I think this is a it's a it's a it's a fantastic book that's gotten rave reviews. This is mm -hmm. uh Nyati's book. It's called Betting on a Darkie, Lifting the Corporate Game. This is the book that came out. It was in October this year. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's quite it's quite a profound statement to make betting on the darky you yeah. know um <laughs> saying take it a chance basically yes. you know yeah. take a chance on me i can do this and mm. you know maybe sometimes people think you know but 
you're almost just trying to be uh, along the lines of BEE and putting the face in the job and they don't necessarily have the skills to do that. And I'm, I'm speaking for a lot of what South Africans mm. have to say and they're mm. not necessarily the right person for the job. Mm. But you've proved it wrong every single time that you've mm. gone in and you have done the job properly mm. and that it has been perfect. Are we at a point in South Africa where we look at leaders and we say they are the best person for the job and they are not there because of X, Y and Z? Mm. Look, I don't necessarily think we are, we are at that point. I, th I think uh, if, if you are a black person, you are in a particular leadership role, people naturally would think you are there because of, you know, of BEE. Uh, when in reality, there are many thousands of leaders uh, in our country that are doing great things, black leaders that are doing great things. Uh, people that have been given opportunities, they've grabbed those opportunities, ran with those opportunities, and are demonstrating that there is not one group of people that have got monopoly on excellence. Mm -hmm. You know, if people apply themselves, they can deliver ex ex exceptional results. You know, we've got so many of those. So that's really what is behind that book, saying, please give people opportunities, not favors, opportunities. And if you give people opportunities and support them, amazing things can happen. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we're looking for in this country. Indeed, and mm. it is. It's something that we need to look to. Mm. But however, when we look at South Africa and we mm. look at mm. all these commissions that sit and we, we talk about those last uh, nine years, the last mm. ten years, and everybody talks to the last ten, nine years here mm. in South Africa as the, the wasted years, the years that perhaps the state was captured. And mm. we all talk to this and say, did we sell South Africa down the river? Um, and are we trying to recover from that? Again, we talk to a lack of leadership. We as South Africa are, South Africa are a democratic country. Mm. Should we be in this position that we're in right now as a democracy? Um, I, I don't think so. Um, look, you know, I've never run a country. Uh, I'm sure it's a big challenge. But I'm saying if we were to approach a leader, you know, in his definitive term, that you are there to represent the aspirations of the people, I think the outcome will be completely different. It's never about you, it's about others. If it's about others, then the approach should be different. And what that means is that we need to be doing things differently. And um, as far as I'm concerned, wh why people tend to associate uh, black people who climb up the ladder with tokenism and the like is that in some respects, our people hasn't done us favors. Mm -hmm. There are people who have been put in positions where they have never really performed at all. They had no power, but yet they enjoy the money. Uh, I know that for a fact. So, you know, it's another, in my view, wrongful application of transformation initiatives. Yeah. But that does not mean that everyone is like that. Like Mr. Nyati is saying, he represents those people that are actually excellent and it's our task to find them and support them and our support must not be conditional on any political party allegiance that's the biggest problem of south africa today yeah. or political correctness what we need to be looking for are people with solutions that can help this country grow Mm -hmm. I, I'm looking through this book and I'm, I'm, I'm a little preoccupied because during, during our little break between each other, I mean, I have to confess, I'm, it's the first time I'm holding your book. I wish I, I, wish I had it before. But th there's, there's a beautiful foreword that's been written by our former president, Thabo Mbeki, for you in this book. Um, and somewhere in it, he, you also allude to what happened and how difficult things were in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what was it? What, what, is, what are you alluding to here? And can you feel the narrative changing over this, these last couple of years that we are now finding ourselves in? Look, uh, there, there are many things that were happening over the last nine years, but one of them is if, if you are black and, and, and maybe uh, you're doing a great thing, you're not, you're not necessarily celebrated. In fact, there was a time where you used to be called names, you know. Uh, the, you know I can't remember the there. Clever blacks. The clever blacks, yes. you know. Yes. So, and that was anti excellence, you know. So, we are actually promoting, uh, you know, doing things in the wrong way. So, so, that narrative that was going on at the time, that is so bad. 
for it was so bad for our country yeah. you know it sets us backwards you know you kind of go back to your little corner you know you, instead of coming in and trying to help solve things you go uh, you move backwards yeah. and and that's not what we needed in this country but the good thing is that uh, things are at least has created the space uh, Ramaphosa and and he's, he's continues to be a person who looks like he listens I wish he can take even more bold decisions though you know we need bold leadership going forward indeed mm. yeah bold leadership what kind of leadership do you mm. say we need Peter mm. I'm gonna wrap the interview with us mm. now I, I support what he's saying we need decisive and bold leadership mm. and remember leadership is not about a uh, what I usually tell my staff that I'm not in a popularity contest. Mm. Leadership is about taking tough decisions. We need to take them for South Africa to move forward. I've loved this conversation with both of you. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your wisdom, talking to us about what we need as leaders in South Africa. Peter uh, Chisebe, founder of the TRG Attorneys, and Nteto Nyati, who is the CEO of Eltron Group, discussing the differences in leadership between public and the private sector and what we as South Africans need as good leaders.